like to start now formally the, the, the webinar uh, and welcome, welcoming all of you uh, to our fourth webinar organized by the European Young Innovators Forum. Uh, the reason why we are organizing this webinar is really as, uh, that we have understood that these are very, very important times, very difficult times, and that the role of public funding can be instrumental in helping startups, tech companies, growth companies that are not the typical SMEs to navigate the crisis better. So a bit about ourselves, we are the European Young Innovators Forum. We have been around since, since 2010. So we, we were created, I'm one of the founders in uh, the previous crisis. Uh, and so now we will be navigating and hopefully succeeding uh, again this, this crisis together. So we are one of the 12 Startup Europe ambassadors. Uh, and we have been very active in engaging with the ecosystem. So one of our latest uh, initiatives is promoting war, more uh, diversity and more women founders uh, in Europe to match them with investors. We have uh, been in, in the last 12 months in more, uh, in more uh, than nine cities engaged with uh, more than, more than 1,000 people in total between founders, uh, uh, investors, mentors. So. Today, uh, what I want you to uh, see is that we have some very basic rules. So it will be uh, a 60 minutes in total of the webinar. Uh, after my introduction, I will be introducing our, our speakers uh, that have made the time today. So I was telling you that we have very, very uh, valuable speakers today uh, from uh, the European Innovation Council, uh, uh, the European Commission, Katarina Morunska, uh, from the EIF, uh, the Deputy Director and Head, uh, head of uh, Venture Capital Investments, Uli graben walters and uh, Laurent Roux from the European Institute of Technology Headquarters, who is in charge of all the EIT communities all across Europe. The reason why we have these three uh, speakers and these three institutions today is because we have uh, a very holistic view on the ecosystem. So we need everybody in the ecosystem to come up with proposals, come up with solutions to uh, make sure that startups can navigate the, the, the crisis. So that's why we, we start from the very top with uh, Uli uh, Grevenwater from the EIF. I know that there are several investors and venture capitalists attending today the session and they are keen to hear what you have to uh, provide as answers uh, and, and, and solutions for them. I know there are some initiatives that you have taken. I know, uh, Katerina, uh, you are here to tell us about the European Innovation Council, the EIC Accelerator, and other programs that are here to really uh, uh, put some uh, cash in into very valuable companies that we have in Europe. So I would like to hear from you what are the measures that also the, the, the Commission is taking. And, and Laurent, who you, you are responsible for all the EIT, uh, for all the EIT community, so you know what is happening on the ground. The EIT has, I, I would like to know how many partners, but hundreds of partners, hundreds of companies that you have been engaged. So what, is, what are their requests and what are the, uh, the initiatives that you are putting together? So I hope that by the end of the, of the session, all of us, uh, including also our speakers, we, we know what the others are, are doing from, uh, uh, from a more personal perspective. Yeah. So welcome everybody. Uh, I will start with uh, with you, uh, Uli. As uh, was mentioned, you know, I want to start from the top down, from the more gener generic approach. And this will be a question that I want the three of you uh, to answer: uh, is since which uh, since when did you realize that this crisis was really uh, here to stay and was not going to be a V-shape recovery and was much more. Uh, uh, difficult than, than people thought at the beginning, and what was the reaction of your institution to that? Yeah, so Oli, and then I will follow with Katerina, and then Law. Yeah. Well, I think uh, yeah. First of all, hello to everybody, and uh, and welcome to this uh, to this webinar, uh, which is probably going to be um, uh, the type of uh, the recurrent uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and information and, and views uh, for the foreseeable future, as it seems. And uh, I think it's one of the expressions of uh, um, what different times we've uh, moved into in a matter of weeks. Um, um, I think uh, if you ask concretely what has been the trigger point, um, I think for entire Europe, the trigger point has been that um, we have seen the escalation of, uh, of COVID-19 in, in a number of countries and probably starting with Italy 
and uh, and moving uh, so rapidly out of control that the only response to that uh, um, that uh, could help us uh, collectively contain the spread of this was an economic lockdown. And uh, um, I think um, that was uh, a bit more than, than than five weeks ago, probably when we started to realize that um, uh, we needed to make a choice between uh, uh, safeguarding the economy and safeguarding people. And obviously the choice was uh, that we needed to save people first. Um, uh, but then uh, with the um, uh, reflection on uh, what um, um, that has as a repercussion in terms of um, long-term effects uh, on economy and, and obviously with the economy on the life of people, uh, that's something that has kicked in uh, swiftly, swiftly thereafter. And uh, from that very moment on um, in, at EIF, we have started um, uh, looking at um, um, assessing what's the impact on the, on the areas uh, that uh, we operate in um, uh, will be and what we can do about to, uh, to smoothen that to the best possible way. And um, you have probably followed through the news that uh, since then there are a lot of discussions going on with uh, uh, national rescue plans, with pan-European uh, uh, rescue plans. European Commission has uh, uh, stepped, up, uh, stepped up its, uh, its debate of what can be done uh, short-term, medium-term, long-term to deal with that crisis. We have done the same thing in the EAB group and, uh, and uh, we have done that since we have actually had this awareness that this is something that is going to be big and, and very substantial almost 24-7. Uh, um, most of the EIF staff has been working through the Easter weekend to, um, to work on concepts to respond to that crisis and to try to come up with solutions that can help um, sustaining our venture capital ecosystem uh, and, and helping it to navigate it through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uli. So it's, it's very important to understand how the EIF is supporting those who invest in the companies. And it, it, it was a very good introduction. Uh, Katrina, so you uh, at the European Commission also have uh, made a lot of uh, thinking, have come up with proposals, packages. The role of the European Innovation Council has also been uh, put forward. Uh, can you tell us a bit more how, what was the reaction also internally in, in, in the last few weeks and when did you realize that this was uh, coming to stay? Yeah. Yes, certainly. Maybe before I start uh, saying what we've done, just a little introduction because indeed I work in the European Innovation Council Task Force within DG Research and Innovation where we deal um, mainly with uh, the EIST and the setting up of the EIST under Horizon Europe but also with the pilot that runs now. But alongside that, uh, my unit also deals with financial instruments, mainly in OFIN, uh, the EU Finance for Innovators, where we work very closely with the EIF and also the EIB on uh, supporting innovative SMEs, uh, mid-caps and other type of companies. So it is, my answer will slightly touch upon the EIC, but also the bigger picture of financial instruments uh, that we have. Um, I agree with uh, Uli that the main trigger point on our side were the lockdowns that were introduced starting early mid-March mid um, when we started implementing different measures to support the economy and the key sectors of the economy uh, that were touched by, by the lockdowns. Um, so the first action was by the Commission to call for a coordinated uh, economic response to the COVID-19 crisis. And there, together with the, with the EIF, we worked on um, unlocking 1 billion from the European Fund of Structure for um, Strategic Investments um, in order to channel a guarantee to the EIF uh, that could then uh, incentivize banks to provide loans to innovative companies, um, mainly SMEs. Uh, which were touched uh, quite deeply uh, by the crisis. But since I work also in DG Research and Innovation, um, what we certainly didn't underestimate since the beginning of the crisis was the health impact uh, that it would have. Um, already in January, we had a call um, for proposals tackling uh, the COVID-19 uh, issues in terms of developing vaccines, treatment, diagnostics. Um, and we already have 18 projects working in this domain um, and supporting teams of over 150 researchers in this area. So our action um, from within the Commission, but 
uh, from RTD in particular focuses on both aspects. Uh, so providing uh, immediate support to SMEs that are being affected, but also uh, supporting innovative companies um, to develop solutions to the crisis that we really need uh, in terms of the health element. So thank you, Katrina. So uh, it's, it's important also for all of you who are uh, want to ask questions, you have the Q&A uh, uh, tool. Please write, write all your questions. We are also live on YouTube. Uh, that I know that we we have several several uh, uh, several people there. So also hello, uh, and Laurent. Uh, now it's your turn. Please tell us. Uh, you have a much more localized approach, a much more uh, vertical approach, also. So can you tell us a bit more? How uh, have you felt the impact? What are the measures that you're taking, and how can we uh, how can we start uh, taking benefit from from that? Well, thank you, Nicola. Um, just to clarify uh, up front, you know, so I'm in charge of the acceleration programs of the EIT communities, not all the EIT communities. That would be a big task. That's more for the director and everybody involved. And we have indeed thousands of partners across Europe in, as you said, you know, eight verticals like digital, sustainable energy, climate, health. And of course, you know, to answer your question of when we we started uh, really working on this, I think it's similar to Uli and, and Katerina. It's early March, even though we had some early warning signs because we are, as you said, quite localized. We are present in most countries in Europe, including uh, Italy and countries that were affected, I think, a bit earlier than others. We also have an office in Israel. We have an office in the US. Uh, we have some partners in China. So we, we started really looking at the situation a little bit earlier, sometime in, in January. And since then, we've been very, very busy uh, working with all the innovation communities to kind of redirect their, their budget to, to immediate actions to, uh, to deal with the COVID-19 situation, to uh, you know support their existing portfolio companies, and also to attract new ones, uh, to, to find solutions and um, develop new new ideas around uh, addressing this this this, this uh, crisis. And I think uh, you know to to answer you know for, for all the opportunities that are out there. I mean, we have set up a special page on our website that has you know all the activities and initiative that, for example, EIT Health has done in the last few weeks, and they're planning to do in the coming weeks to to really mobilize more funding towards uh, towards COVID nineteen. Uh, EIT Digital is also launching a special deep tech. Um, hack hackathon on, 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 on finding solutions for COVID-19. All the communities are, are very mobilized there and also the IT alumni. I mean, we have a community of more than 8,000 alumni members across Europe and they are the ones that are on the ground, mostly affected young entrepreneurs. You know, they see funding drying up. They see, you know, valuation kind of going down. Uh, it's more difficult to work with partners, to find clients and so on, because you don't have that, you know, participation in events and going meeting the clients, everybody's working remote. So this transition period, uh, we hope it's a transition period, is, is going to last. So they are affected and, um, and we are you know, in co weekly contact with them through the Alumni Association to provide them with solution, with additional funding if they need to, and also for them to share good practice that they have in the different countries they are, they are active in. Um, so we are very really engaged with our community uh, and also the partner SMEs. I mean, everybody in the different sectors is, is, um, is affected. I mean, I, I invite all of you who are attending this webinar to also go on the IT website. There's a dedicated page COVID-19 uh, that has all the funding opportunities um, and all the initiative that we've started and that we will continue in the, in the coming weeks and coming months. Th thank you very much, Laurent. I'm uh, coming back to you, Lee, and, and from the general perspective on, so we, we hear a lot now of support to, uh, support to entrepreneurs, to startup tech companies, but what, what is the situation currently on the venture capital and investor uh, uh, sector? How, how do you see the impact of the COVID-19? What is the relationship that we are uh, having with the funds that, that you have invested in? Are you planning to extend the facilities? Have you launched new facilities? I know there has been some announcements there. So uh, can you tell us a bit more what is, what is the, the, the structural approach that you're having here? Sure. Well, um, I think maybe to put things into, into perspective, uh, when uh, COVID-19, the crisis uh, hit us um, in a European context, um, I think we, in the venture capital industry and as, uh, as a venture capital ecosystem, we, for the first time in history, have been 
in an environment where um, um, we basically have, uh, for the first time, had a functioning ecosystem. Right? For the last five, six, seven years, we for the first time had in, in Europe uh, a situation where funds uh, uh, quite easily reached a target fund size, where we had funds that were oversubscribed, we had funds that had delivered uh, cash and cash returns to investors that have been attractive uh, to an extent that institutional investors that have been abstaining from that asset class for decades have um, caught um, interest in, uh, in, 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 that, uh, in, in that dimension of asset allocation. And in that, um, in that circumstances, actually, we as EIF, we for the first time in history actually were even in a position to pull back from the market and give that industry back to the private sector, which is actually the role that EIF wanted to play from the outset when we started to rebuild the ecosystem in 2000 after the technology crash. So we had a situation where for the first time we could uh, um, continue to signal support to individual funds, but make space for other investors to move in. When the COVID crisis actually hit, and we have rather instantly um, entered into contact with uh, uh, our vast portfolio fund managers to see what they are experiencing in the market in terms of market dynamics, in terms of interaction with uh, um, uh, syndication partners in financing rounds, so when they were trying to put together financing rounds for portfolio companies, what was the impact on portfolio companies uh, uh, in terms of uh, effects of lockdown and the like, and also what has been their reaction that they've been experiencing from um, uh, investors in their funds, funds that were in the fundraising process and, uh, and were about to close or were launching the fundraising process for going forward. And um, uh, the, the impact uh, that has been reported to us and actually what we continue to, 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 to observe is, is pretty sobering because um, uh, the um, obvious reaction in such a massive uh, uh, systemic shock as the one that we're experiencing with the lockdown basically on a global basis is that um, the investment behavior along the investment chain of uh, um, capital providers becomes very defensive. Uh, we've seen at the level of um, um, investors in funds, uh, uh, the stalling of uh, due diligence processes, uh, we've uh, seen the suspension of subscriptions in, uh, in, in funds that were about to close. Um, we have uh, um, seen institutional investors um, um, basically freezing their investment activity to alternative assets, assets altogether just to see what is going to be the impact um, of the um, global deflation of all assets uh, on the percentage that they actually had dedicated to alternative assets and in which they are normally limited. Uh, we have seen the same behavior at the level of um, um, uh, funds where syndications, um, syndication um, efforts uh, for the funding of portfolio companies have been stalled, have been falling apart, have been reduced massively in size. And that because fund managers, obviously, when they look at the market environment and see um, how difficult it may get to get access to additional capital going forward, and looking at the financing needs of the portfolio companies in the first instance are looking to secure uh, sufficient funding for their portfolio companies before they look into uh, diversifying their portfolio by co-investing with other funds in the market. And that's something that um, has also instantly um, shown in the, in, in, the, in the market behavior, which means that if we look at the perspective of what we um, uh, have to expect for, uh, for, the, for the months and the years to come, I think we can differentiate between short-term effects on the market, which is obviously a, um, um, a, a question of liquidity in the market. Um, how do we sustain companies that, uh, that are in, in need of additional liquidity now and liquidity becoming, uh, becoming uh, scarce? Um, and there's, but there's also the long-term perspective of, um, of, of what happens thereafter and what is the mid to long-term impact on the ecosystem of venture capital in Europe um, when we, when we um, uh, reflect on that. And um, I think um, in order to demonstrate how, how, how this actually um, impacts the market, I, I possibly I'd like to use the metaphor of, um, of a fuel tank for your heating at home. Um, when you are a venture capitalist, you basically plan ahead in your, uh, uh, in your availability of resources and the cash needs that is, um, um, that is out there for, the portfolio, for, 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 for your portfolio to grow. 
and like for a heating in ahead of the winter you're filling up your um, your fuel tank and say okay i'm going to make it through the winter with that and then suddenly a siberian winter hits you and um, you have to actually consume more fuel to keep um, the heating going and that in the first instance may not have the immediate impact that um, that you will notice because it's still warm inside because you just use more fuel for keeping the temperature up but uh, it doesn't take away uh, the certainty that in using more fuel when you come towards the tail end of the winter you're going to be short of fuel and a little bit the same analogy applies to the venture market as we see it now what we see in the first instance is that fund managers obviously have tried to secure uh, the um, uh, the liquidity needs of their portfolio companies by uh, uh, using flexibly recycling provisions in their funds, uh, by possibly uh, uh, injecting convertible debt in the portfolio companies, which they hope to get out uh, um, and be able to, to, to reuse in other investments as, as we move forward. Uh, there, is, uh, um, there are requests to LPs to increase the liquidity um, by uh, creating more flexibility around, uh, around short-term borrowings and, and the like. But all this is going to be a short-term measure that um, that uh, needs to be um, uh, that needs to be catered for uh, to deal with the urgency. In the mid to long term, what we what we actually have to uh, cater for in the venture capital industry is that there will be a prolonged um, hesitation and possibly a um, abstinence of uh, institutional investment backing that industry. And we will see a contraction of um, availability of capital um, in the venture capital space uh, for the funds that are currently in fundraising that are going to be in fundraising next year and that they're going to uh, basically provide the um, necessary fuel across the full uh, uh, investment cycle uh, of, of portfolio companies for the couple of years to come or even more. And I think when we look at uh, emergency measures and response measures uh, to, the, um, uh, to the COVID crisis, as important as it is that we take uh, the pressure out of the urgency in the current situation and, and provide for liquidity in the market. And I think the European Commission has, uh, has acted very swiftly on that. And uh, uh, Katerina has been mentioning the one billion that has been basically uh, mobilized in, 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 in a snap um, in a very swift decision process. And uh, we also have uh, from DGRDP, uh, we've received additional resources to help funds through this short-term uh, liquidity squeeze by being able to uh, rely on additional resources uh, for uh, um, uh, top-up facilities for funds and the like. That's a very necessary and very welcome um, uh, uh, kind of measure to, to be taken. But what we also need to look at is um, how do we sustain the flow in this industry so that it can uh, not only defend the existing portfolio companies, not only defend existing business models, but uh, work towards what we actually all need in, uh, uh, in the mid to long term to sustain our innovation environment in Europe and also to be able to back companies that work towards business models that will eventually help us to prevent going into such a situation in the future again and i think uh, by now we all have understood that um, um, we will not be able to do that without relying on innovation um, in a very very substantial way thank you thank you very much uli and, and, and i really appreciated your also your your uh, your blogs that you have uh, that you have written uh, uh, also on the topic so uh, I wanted to now to go to Katerina in terms of the world post COVID. So how is the uh, European Commission thinking about this world post COVID and what is your, uh, what is your role in, in shaping this different type of, uh, different, this different type of uh, innovation instruments that we will have and also what are the different options that startups can have? If you can give us some concrete options uh, that the European Commission is thinking and where to find it. Yeah. Okay. So from our perspective, the world post-COVID certainly will uh, rely and we will be built based on innovations, uh, new innovations that will come out during this crisis and also after. Um, of course, now what we are doing is uh, redeploying and refocusing uh, the funds that we have available 
which is slightly different because we are really at the end of the current multi-annual financial framework. But what we really try to do is uh, redeploy them and refocus them uh, for COVID-19 related purposes. Um, we've done that to a certain extent with the EIC. Maybe you've noticed that um, we had a call, a cutoff date uh, in March, on the 20th of March, which was extended also to the COVID-19 uh, related projects. Um, and we achieved um, a lot of applications. We received a lot of applications, which shows, um, shows the enormous interest uh, that companies have and also the innovations that they are working on. Um, so that's one element, but in terms of the world post-COVID, I think what is important uh, for the Commission, but also uh, for the EU in, in general, is to keep focusing on the po policy priorities that we had even before the crisis and to build uh, the world um, or the new normal that's going to be established after, after this crisis um, on the important policy priorities we had, which was mainly and still is um, Green Deal priorities and also digital. I think what we really saw during uh, and what we still see um, in the current situation is how the take up of digital uh, technologies and digital transformation is important uh, for sustaining our way of life, the businesses, uh, etc. Um, so big focus should be still put um, on these elements. What we're doing uh, from, from the perspective of the European Innovation Council, um, actually for the coming, well, the objective of the EIC as such is really to support uh, deep tech startups, um, startups with um, breakthrough or market creating innovations um, that cut between uh, the digital and also the physical world. So from that perspective, we are already uh, putting a lot of emphasis uh, on that angle. Uh, we have two um, still upcoming calls this year uh, within the EAC Accelerated Pilot. One of them is closing on the 19th of May, so quite recently. Uh, and there this call is focusing on uh, Green Deal priorities uh, specifically. So it is not the usual bottom-up call that we usually have. Um, and we are dedicating quite an, a substantial amount of 300 uh, or over 300 million uh, for the project. Um, so I would um, encourage companies, startups that are, that are listening to us and that are active in this domain uh, to certainly apply. And then we will have another call in October uh, that will be bottom up. So any project proposals are, are welcome. Um, and the amount usually for this type of course is in, uh, in the amount of 160 million. Um, then EIC will, of course, continue uh, in 2021 under Horizon Europe with new calls. Uh, so I would um, encourage you to continue um, to look at what the possibilities will be. But then we also have another uh, program, the InvestEU program, which will bring new opportunities for companies, small and large, to apply uh, for funding. Um, under specific uh, policy windows uh, and specific products that are still uh, being developed. But it is clear that um, the key focus is on supporting of SMEs, of research, innovation and digitalization, but also supporting projects um, that contribute to the climate and environment objectives. So this, uh, this focus really remains. And what I wanted to say, I know it's post-COVID, um, but Laurent also mentioned many activities that the EIC has currently, um, which are also important for, for the future, but mostly for now. And I wanted to say that um, similarly, also in the EIC, we have many um, hackathons and e-pitching events that are ongoing at the moment. Um, so for example, today there is an EU versus virus uh, pan-European wide hackathon being launched at five o'clock, I think this evening by the commissioner. Uh, so I would once again um, invite all of you to follow um, the innovations that are going to be developed in the process. Yes, and I know there are more than 15,000 people registered already there. Uh, yes, so what, what we uh, will be sharing with every, every attendee, also we will be uh, sharing all the links to the platforms that have been mentioned. Uh, so. Uh, Laurent, I'm coming to you. Uh, you have already listed uh, the set of uh, initiatives. So very concretely, uh, how are you working with the ecosystem to 
uh, support them. So there are initiatives. You're working with also investors. You're also working with partners. Is there anything uh, that you would recommend today to an audience of companies uh, to um, tap into the EIT resources? Yeah, thank you, Nicola. I mean, it, it depends. I mean, if you're an existing uh, participating company or a partner, obviously you're already very close within your own community, you know, innovation community. So I think there the discussions are going, the additional opportunities are visible, they're being shared with the partners, with the startups, especially in the scale-ups that are in the different acceleration programs. So that has already started. Uh, what we're trying to do here for the existing portfolio companies to mobilize additional funding. So there are still, you know, ongoing discussions at our governing board level and also with the commission, but this should be hopefully announced very uh, soon. And that would be an, a significant increase of, of funding available for the startups and SMEs for 2020 already. Quite a big increase from what we have already planned, which is around 50, 60 million this year, but we would so make a significant a building of uh, funds. Uh, exactly, exactly, for 2020. So that's in, that would be both for the existing portfolio companies, but also new ones that are interested to come and work with us uh, to, to fight specifically the COVID-19, find so all kinds of solutions uh, yeah. to, to this crisis for the short, but also as uh, Uli and Catalina said, for the medium and long term. I mean, this is a pandemic that we have now, but there will be probably other ones we have to you know, invent this new world, uh, not just for the next two years, but for probably the next 25, if we can. So, um, you know, EIT will be, you know, very happy to work with companies that have uh, solutions for that. Um, as you said, also, we work with the investors. I mean, at our level, it's a lot of angel investors, but also VCs, specialized VCs in energy field and digital field and so on. And as Uli mentioned, I mean, there is a kind of a hes hesitation now. Uh, people are posing. Um, they want to protect their portfolio companies, but also, you know, they, they, they don't see the future very clearly. And uh, this actually was already starting a little bit in, in January, February, I mean, from the reports we're getting from, uh, you know, Peach Book and Deal Room and so on. You could see a trend already, kind of some kind of peak being reached before even the crisis started. So and now on top, we have to deal with, with this and even investors are quite hesitant and, and prudent to, to say the least. So we're working with them to try to still present them with good deals. Um, we're working with the companies to to help them, you know, uh, present themselves even better, look at valuation, manage their cash flow, and, and all the, you know, in a way, the lesson learned from the 2008 crisis, which, you know, took a while to recover, and this is very different, as Uli said, even more dramatic, so we can expect several years of, of uh, ch choppy, choppy waters for all of us, but, um, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, we're communicating with the alumni also, uh, because they, they, are, they are, you know, the existing students, graduates, founders of companies that are in the early uh, stage of their entrepreneurial journey. And for them, you know, it's very important to have access to information, to what are the programs available. So we make this information available to them and to everybody on our website and our newsletters, social media, and the kicks. The innovation communities are also, you know, doing their part because they are the ones who are really, you know, their different offices across Europe in contact with the local ecosystem. So they are channeling that information very quickly, actually on a weekly basis. Thank you. And so before I move to the questions, we are receiving already many questions, but please uh, send, us, uh, send us more uh, questions. I know that we have investors, venture capitalists here. We also have uh, uh, companies. We also have uh, community enablers. So please share your questions. This is, uh, uh, this is the, the, the moment to do it. Before I move to the questions, I want to sort of conclude this panel with uh, the, uh, a sentence that, that, and I will be sharing, there is a request for that, the, the blog post from, that you wrote, Uli, but you said, uh, the, whatever the, the amount that we mobilize now, uh, and this is important for everybody, uh, uh, we can be sent, cer certain that it will be cheaper uh, than fix, fixing the system once. It has been taken down by the next global crisis. So one minute each, uh, Uli, if you want to start, because it was your sentence, tell us what you thought about that. But I want also Katerina and Laurent, one minute each, and then we move to the questions, please. Well, one, one minute each, um, probably prefer leaving them a space for the, for the discussion. But what I was ex trying to express with that is that we definitely need to move our entire thinking when we look at the development of our economy. Uh, towards an anticipative approach rather to, than a reactive approach. Um, I think what we have learned from this crisis is that uh, uh, there are plenty of solutions that uh, are available in our innovation space that we have uh, 
potentially neglected in their impact that they can create for our societal functioning uh, that could have prevented us going into such a massive uh, um, human crisis, uh, economic crisis, and, uh, and the lockdown that we, that, that we are facing with the implications going forward. And uh, I think the call that I would uh, make uh, across the board to uh, policymakers, public sector, private sector, uh, investment communities is that we need to think what we're investing in and we need to think at how we can monetize the societal value in our investments rather than being indifferent to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Uri, for that. Uh, Katerina, please. No, certainly. It's a very uh, nice statement and I'm looking forward to reading Uli's uh, full report. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it, but I would agree that we need to see this crisis to a certain extent as an opportunity um, that should push us to work together in a coordinated way. Um, and we, when we talk about mobilizing funding, it's not only about the public funding, but um, bringing together the public and private um, to invest uh, into projects that will help us in solving the crisis, but also into preparing us to fare better uh, in, uh, in the future. Um, and in that sense, we're really trying to do um, our best to mobilize funding that we have available to mobilize even more resources um, to help the companies that need our help, but that also can help us um, for the future. Yeah. Thank you, Laurent. One minute, and then yeah, I, I will keep it very short because I've, you know, I think both uh, Uli and, and Katarina have said everything. You know, I think it's we have to really think of this long term, not not this short term, and live in fear. I think this is, you know, how governments and policymakers are pro approaching this. We need to try to, you know, go beyond the fear and really look forward and and mobilize what needs to be mobilized now. Because indeed, if we don't do it, it will be much more costly down the road. Uh, what we do also at EIT is, you know, again, we, we share, I mean, our own opportunities and additional funding and everything the kicks are doing, but also keep very closely track of what is being done at the national level by the different governments. And we make this visible even more to, to our startups because we are present in all the countries in Europe and these uh, entrepreneurs uh, can also benefit from their, their own national programs uh, in addition to what we can do for them. So, and there's a lot being done. Uh, it just needs to be, sometimes it's not visible enough or it's a bit confusing Using. So we try to keep a really clear list of, on a weekly basis again, of what is available, what is being made, how to access it, and this is shared with the, the entire EIT community. And you know, we welcome others to join us because this is an open community. Okay, thank you very much. So I will take the questions. So please be short in the answer because we have already thirteen questions. So uh, one that I think is very important is on impact investing. Yeah. So. Um, that uh, and this was raised by by one of our community neighbors so what from the perspective of a support organization for social entrepreneurship do you see this as opportunity to rebuild key industries in a more sustainable way so this is a question on impact investing that also some uh, another another person was asking uh, so who wants to take it uh, on the social uh, impact in uh, an impact investing part Want to take it as you want to start? Yeah, Only I please. can take that. Um, um, since yeah. impact investing is one of my big passions, um, um, I think, frankly speaking, um, I do think that we stand at the point where um, impact investing is going to become the normality. Because when we look at um, what any business is going to be charged going forward, it is about the value that it creates to issues that the society is facing. And um, if you think of investment from that perspective and you look for investment models or business models that are competitive in such an environment, you naturally will look for business models that create responses to things, things that we need to solve as a, as a society. And um, um, from, from the perspective of um, uh, the COVID crisis, I think uh, we can obviously reflect to how we can support the life sciences industry to make us better equipped to, um, to deal with uh, pan pandemics and things like that. But it's not limited to that. It is also questioning how can we make our entire economic system uh, immune through a, um, 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 a kind of a global logistic system that, and, and, and business processes that are totally linear and cannot be managed in a decentralized manner. I think that globalization as such has been put in question big time 
by the uh, by the current environment and uh, technology and innovation can create solutions for managing um, uh, localized business solutions in a global context by connecting um, the different um, economic areas without making them uh, dependent on each other in a way that uh, that leads to a total breakdown of the system if we face a situation like the current one. And um, if we look at it from an impact perspective, obviously also from the alleviation of uh, uh, human uh, human tragedies and human um, uh, health issues, but also um, uh, societal uh, issues of uh, poverty, access to employment, and things like that. Yes, social enterprises um, will play a vital part in that in, in getting us back on track. And I think um, we are called upon from an investment side, but also from a policy side, to give um, social enterprises an at least equal access to capital um, than normal companies. I think what we've done in the past, we have uh, considered uh, uh, social enterprises as being such a worthwhile to be protected community that we have uh, created a lot of funding instruments around that, but at the same time, we have been requesting from them a proof of being a social enterprise that was more cumbersome than any access to capital for any normal company in the market. And that, to me, that is counterintuitive. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is, is somebody uh, else wanted to comment on impact investment? If not, I can go directly to Katarina. You have many questions on your plate on the EIC. <laughs> So um, I so the first one that you have, Katarina, that you can very quickly answer is that if there will be any delay on the EIC accelerator for October in the debt in the deadline. So that that is one of them. Uh, then uh, there are some others uh, companies that are asking: Will there be uh, funding for non-COVID related solutions in the in the short term? Uh, that's another question that has been raised. Uh, another one that uh, they are asking very concrete information on, on where can, can uh, proposals be submitted uh, to reduce contagions. So anything that you can provide now as a concrete uh, actionable information for these companies who want to apply for EU funding in the next few months in mm -hmm. terms of areas, in terms of deadlines or uh, in terms of platforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe as a follow up, I can also provide links that you can share with the participants, which may be the easiest solution in terms of uh, the deadlines. So the only COVID-19 related call, let's say, even though it was not uh, meant to be, um, and it is only partially, was the one with the cut of date already in March. Uh, so we only allowed um, proposals we asked specifically proposals addressing COVID-19 um, to apply for this 20 March uh, cutoff and we are not currently planning to have a specific COVID-19 call um, throughout this year. The reason for that being that we really wanted to address uh, the issue as quickly as possible and even though we are quite fast with the evaluation um, and providing grants and also equity or investments uh, to the companies um, still, it takes some time. So the March cutoff, which already passed, means that there will be interviews with the selected uh, proposals uh, applicants in May, which then means grant uh, further in May or in June. So we really want it to be as fast as possible. And for this reason, currently, we do not expect another specific call. This doesn't mean that uh, companies that are working on COVID-related solutions cannot apply to the further cutoffs. Of course, they can. But just to recap, uh, the cut of date we have on the 19th of May is Green Deal related, which limits, um, of course, uh, the area of activities that uh, the companies can, uh, can apply. So it will be only Green Deal related call, but in October, um, the cut off is bottom up. So any proposals, health related, energy, um, also social innovation is part of it, um, agriculture, anything. For the time being, I do not have any information on the cut of date being extended. So we are counting on, uh, I think it's the 9th, 7th or 9th of October. I'm not sure, um, but I, I can provide that later on. Thank you very much. And I, I will go to Laurent for, I, I'm sure you can answer this one on uh, if there will be specific programs for logistics and mobility startups. I know the, the EIT has just launched the EIT mobility. 
so maybe you can answer this question to uh, class uh, Nirad, uh, and then I will go to a question that was asked to you, Uli, by David Benzel, uh, uh, a venture capital from Denmark. Yes, indeed. I mean, EIT Open Mobility is, is open and running. Uh, they are creating special calls and uh, to respond to this crisis. It's on their website. It's also on our website. If you go under eit.europa.eu COVID-19, there is a page with all the links for the different communities and EIT Mobility is, is listed there. Um, yeah, so they will be there to help. I mean, obviously there's a lot of overlaps also, you know, solutions can come also in the digital, will come in the digital space, could be energy related. So, you know, in, in, in the case of urban mobility and mobility in general, you, you know, you go to EIT Urban Mobility, but you can also go to the, uh, some of the other kicks that uh, are kind of, you know, working on that as well. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's ongoing. Our calls are ongoing. Also, I wanted to say that most of the on, uh, acceleration services that we were delivering in person until now are now moved fully on online so everything is being done online all the kicks are innovation committees are delivering the services online um, so you know it's it's better than nothing and it's working very well actually in, in most cases and uh, you know we will keep this as long as, as we need to, uh, to to deliver the services already this year not not get too disrupted by the the lockdown and, and also it varies country by country so being online is, is actually a great asset for the EIT community Thank you, Laurent. Uh, so, Uli, I'm going to you. You have a question directly from David Vensel. So, he's from a, 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 an investment acceleration an investment firm from Denmark. Are you changing strategy in relation to funding new VC funds, emerging managers as a consequence of the crisis in terms of number of new funds, commitment levels, geographic focus? Uh, that's one. And I will add another one that I think you can answer at the same time. Uh, is that uh, raised by Vishwa uh, Tomar, that other than raising and designating funds, are there any specific steps that are being taken or planned to reduce the time taken in uh, disbursements uh, for these funds? Yeah. Okay, uh, happy to take those two. Um, uh, I think in terms of the strategy that we are having in relation to uh, the funding VCs, um, in terms of our uh, spectrum of intervention, we are not going to change our approach. However, we are, we are um, increasing our support to the, uh, to the market, uh, meaning that in the first instance, we are going to focus on the funds that are the most advanced in their own fundraising process and help that we can help with, uh, with a significant commitment to get to the market uh, in the fastest possible way. Um, because um, uh, our objective is, um, as I said in the introduction, not just only to uh, deliver a short-term relief to the market, but actually to keep the VC ecosystem afloat and um, sufficiently capitalized that it can hopefully return as quickly as possible to a normal flow of funding towards the portfolio company and not being defensive of the, about the portfolio. That requires that we equip the industry with, uh, with, sufficient, uh, with sufficient capital. That means that uh, we are going where we see that our catalytic effect can make the difference. We are going to step up our commitment to first closings of, um, uh, of funds. And in cases where um, in the current environment, they fall short of support from the private sector to reach the target fund size, we are going to make a more effort, uh, an increased effort to help them to um, to get to that, that, that type of level that helps them to execute on their investment strategy. We are also looking, um, as we speak, very intensively about um, how can we, um, for funds that we have already backed in first closing, so in the past that we are in need of additional liquidity, how we can provide additional liquidity to them in streamlined processes as well, without going through the full process uh, of due diligence and things like that again, but where we can actually build on the knowledge that we have on those funds to um, to increase uh, our commitment to, um, uh, to them in order to equip them better to navigate through that, through that crisis. Uh, one element, obviously, uh, and that's the, the question to um, how can we shorten the time to the market of the capital that we deploy? There's one constraint, obviously, that we have in our intervention model, which is that we are fund of fund investors. We can help to create liquidity at the level of the funds. We cannot direct funds to actually um, create um, flows of, of capital in, 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 in a manner that is directed by us to portfolio companies. And that has uh, its disadvantages, but it also has um, its uh, intrinsic necessity in the venture capital business model because venture capital is 
above all based on selectivity and um, we are operating through a layoff fund manager precisely to have that skill set and the um, and the knowledge for the selectivity in place in order to make sure that the companies that uh, need money but also deserve the money because the business models are viable get access to that funding and not everybody uh, that is coming along that might distort the market in a way that is not healthy either. Yes, thank you very much, Uli. And I, I, I'm seeing many questions on uh, ed tech, the future of work, uh, and online learning. So, how do you see uh, the development in the in the upcoming month uh, and years on funding available for this ed tech, uh, uh, online skills and e skills development? Uh, do you want to to take it, uh, Laurent, and then maybe uh, uh, Katrina, if there is something in, in the pipeline? Here. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we of course are a heavy user of these uh, technologies as EIT deliver a lot of education programs with our partner universities. So all, also all these uh, courses have now gone online. Uh, in terms of startups and funding, some solutions, I mean, there's a, there are a few, I think, that are part of the uh, EIT digital portfolio. And I think we'll probably see more and more coming to us for, for funding and support. I think it's, you know, it's already a lot of progress that was made the last, um, I would say seven years. I think now a lot of it is going to be adopted much faster probably than than it, it was initially anticipated, which is a good thing for the these companies and their investors. They will, I mean, we see, uh, you know, high, high uptake, uh, increase of the membership in certain of these platforms over a matter of a few weeks, you know, they went, you know, they did. So it's similar things will happen with EdTech. Um, and then, you know, we're waiting to, to work with, uh, with some and we, we're using a lot of them in our different education programs. So, yeah. That's that's how, and it's it's here to last. Sorry, do you have something, Katrina, in, in the pipelines uh, on your side, uh, preparing for the sector? Maybe not specifically to the sector in terms of future of work, but in in general, when we talk about um, digital technologies, but also artificial intelligence and others, we've uh, put in place several pilots quite yeah. recently under our instruments. So if I'm talking about the ones that are implemented by the EIF on the Innofin SME guarantee side, through which, so it's a guarantee to the EIF that then provides a guarantee to financial intermediaries who finally can provide loans to, to companies, uh, mainly innovative SMEs and also mid caps. There we've put in place um, recently, I think it was early this month, we've extended this uh, facility to provide loans also to digital companies. So companies taking up digital technologies uh, and contributing to the digital transformation. Um, so there we have the specific action and also on the equity side under Innofin Equity, once again implemented by, by the EIF. We've also launched, launched um, a pilot focusing on artificial intelligence. Uh, and blockchain technologies. So there the EIF is looking for us to invest um, into or, or alongside venture capital funds with this specific investment strategy. So I know it doesn't completely address uh, the sector, but I think that broadly uh, we are focusing in this area. Thank you. So uh, I think we're arriving to the end. So I want to uh, ask uh, both Laurent, Oli or Katrina, if you want to have a final word. Uh, if not, uh, also I have a message that uh, I think it, it's very valuable to share it with you from one of the one of the participants in the, in the attendees uh, that I think is very encouraging. It's also to encourage you in your work and in your day-to-day -day work and the, to, to show you the importance of what you are doing and, and how it is received also by the community. Any final word? Maybe I can go very, very briefly. I mean, for, from our side, we will continue working very hard on this. Uh, I mean, we try to reduce also the administrative burden. Everything we, we do has to be a bit more simple, probably. And uh, the importance of the community. So for us, you know, every day we try to take care of our community, uh, get them engaged, get them, find solutions for them. Uh, and this is what will help them get through and get us get through this and come out on the other hand in a much, much better way. Uli or Katrina? Uh... We'll be sharing your 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 uh, blog post that has been requested several times. Yeah. And Nicholas, I would just like to say thank you for the invitation and also to all of those who uh, participated and listened to us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank Nicholas, thank you, thank you from my side too, and maybe um, uh, 
a, a quest for solidarity amongst us. Uh, I think that would be my final word. Um, I think this is not the time for uh, uh, the vanity of any constituency in the ecosystem. Uh, it's something where we need to pull together and look collectively at um, what is needed for everybody out there to get through this crisis in the best possible way. So I think uh, collaboration is key. Thank you, Uli. I think Catherine and Laurent, yes, the community ecosystem, they're very important. And I, this is why I want to read you this final uh, question that was written by, by uh, Cleo Stratman. She uh, said, thank you for this great webinar. So thank you for your interventions. But it's more a comment uh, that despite sometimes in public we hear criticisms on the EU and EU strengths and holding together, especially in this crisis, these webinars and all the actions that are happening uh, are a great example that the EU is indeed important and working well in many aspects. So, of course, there are things to improve, but also it's good for everybody to see the positive achievements. So, just to, I wanted to share this with you to encourage you also into what you are doing, to continue communicating, to continue sharing the information. I know that there are different platforms, but it's always good to continue working with different parties and continue sharing the information uh, it's never it's never enough in, in all that and in as our role uh, the european egg innovators forum will be sharing all the links that have been uh, uh, indicated today all the the, the information repositories uh, it's very important that we navigate this uh, this crisis as 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 good as we can but uh, I know that you are doing all the best and I want to thank you for that. Also, I want to thank our partners uh, who are helping us also to spread the word. We are not alone uh, doing this. Also, I am not alone. I want to thank the team that is behind this uh, uh, and that has helped me to prepare uh, not only the webinar, but also engage with the community. So thank you the team at EYF for doing this. And we can connect on the different uh, social media uh, and really thank you for time. We will be sharing the, the blog post also on our on our website with and with all these um, information repositories. Thank you very much, Uli. Thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you very much, Laurent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye to everybody. Bye bye. Bye.